What you're looking at is the first image of the new Batgirl, introduced to the world in January of 1999. Underneath that mask she is Helena Bertinelli, also known as the Huntress and the only active vigilante that remained in a devastated Gotham after the US government decided to abandon the city instead of investing on its reconstruction. Batman has given up on Gotham, forcing Huntress to adopt the mantle of Batgirl in order to keep fighting, to maintain the image of the Bat alive in the collective minds of the few people that remained in the city. As Batgirl, Huntress was the last glimmer of hope and order for a destroyed Gotham that had lost everything. She was the only warrior whose determination and resolve never faltered, and who stood her ground against impossible odds from day one. Fast forward one year later, to December of 1999, and Gotham City is about to rejoin the country, but the Huntress keeps on fighting, and she is the only one standing between dozens of helpless innocents and a murderous psychopath. For over a year she has fought valiantly a non-stop battle, with small victories that were overshadowed by painful rejections and agonizing defeats, all of these leading up to this moment, the final sacrifice of the true hero of the story, who has now been neglected by the other protectors of the city, and whose fate is now in the hands of a maniac who brutally shoots her multiple times and is about to kill her. This is but one example of the many dreadful events that transpired in no man's land. The Batman story that went too far. No Man's Land began in 1999 and became the final Batman story of the 90s, as the character entered a new decade and the world entered a new millennium. But in order to fully understand the impact of the story, we have to go back a couple of years earlier to take a look at how exactly No Man's Land came to be. By the end of 1997, the Batman comics had gone through an entire year without any big events or crossovers. Batman Legacy was the final big event of 1996, after a streak of crossovers that began in the early 90s with Nightfall, followed by Prodigal, Troika and Contagion. By the end of Legacy, readers were burned out on crossovers, so the people in charge of Batman decided to allow each Batman comic to develop their own unique stories free from crossovers. However, this only lasted for about a year, as in 1998 DC Comics went back to crossovers with Batman Cataclysm. Similar to Batman Contagion, Cataclysm is a story in which Batman has to confront an enemy that he can't beat down. This time it's a massive earthquake that devastates Gotham entirely. Cataclysm was the most intense crossover of the 90s, as we helplessly watch how the legacy of Batman is completely shattered. Wayne Manor and the Batcave are the first places to be destroyed by the earthquake, followed by Gotham City, a place that was carefully built over the previous decade and which now comes crashing down, leaving only a trail of death and destruction. Cataclysm is the most heart wrenching story that showcases a tragedy unlike anything that we had seen before. The ensuing chaos and destruction is really painful to witness, especially when the heroes are helpless against a disaster of this magnitude. Gotham City becomes an apocalyptic nightmare, with fires spreading faster than anyone can contain, buildings collapsing on top of each other, while the bridges and the streets are completely destroyed. Death and destruction are the order of the day, and the human drama that unfolds is one of the most effective storytelling efforts in the Batman comics. After hearing the news about the earthquake, Nightwing rushes from Bloodhaven to Gotham and starts searching among the survivors, the injured and the dead, desperately trying to find the one person that matters the most to him, Barbara. When he finally finds her, Nightwing is beyond relieved and grateful that she is alive, encapsulating what Cataclysm is really about. Barbara had survived because her building was quakeproof, just like every other building owned by Wayne Enterprises, all of them except for Wayne Manor. In fact, Batman was the first one to experience the earthquake when Wayne Manor collapsed on top of the Batcave. It took Batman a very long time to find a way out of the destroyed Batcave, which is why he became the last of the heroes to realize the extent of the damage that his beloved Gotham had endured. The city was not prepared for an earthquake, the GCPD headquarters suffered extensive damage, and the bat signal collapsed into Commissioner Gordon's office, almost killing the commissioner. Gordon was saved by Harvey Bullock, and they quickly joined the rest of the GCPD and the other heroes, working together and giving each other strength against this apocalyptic nightmare. Unfortunately, not everyone in Gotham had this kind of emotional support. Catwoman was trapped inside a building as a result of the earthquake. The survivors inside this building assumed that the building had been bombed, while Catwoman witnessed a little girl dying in her arms. 
Unable to deal with this reality, Catwoman makes her way outside, hoping to find an escape from the tragedy in the beauty of Gotham, only to be confronted with the dark reality. After helping all the survivors out of the collapsed building, Catwoman sits there in silence, contemplating the ruins of the city and waiting to be strong enough to get back up again and keep going. But the strength never comes, and her pain becomes ours as we watch Catwoman mourn for Gotham. This is the most powerful chapter of Cataclysm, where we finally realize that something important, something that we always take for granted, has died. Cataclysm ended with a very questionable plot about a villain called the Quake Master, who turned out to be a complete letdown. In the end, the heroes of Gotham have regrouped, but nobody really knows how Gotham City is going to come back from this one. Not even DC Comics. Cataclysm lasted for a couple of months across all the Batman titles, but by the end of the story, Gotham was still destroyed and there were no signs of a quick recovery. That's because DC Comics was not even sure what exactly would happen next. When they began Cataclysm, they didn't expect to end the story by quickly rebuilding the city, but rather they wanted to explore the new status quo of a destroyed Gotham and the different possibilities that it presented. The aftermath of Cataclysm was explored in the following months and it was called Aftershock, which was evidently a transition period between Cataclysm and whatever DC came up with next. In the first couple of months of Aftershock, the Batman comics showcased bright and optimistic stories, with Batman doing anything he could to help his devastated city, providing hope to the hopeless as he kept fighting, despite the impossible odds. But then, a couple of months into Aftershock, the concept for No Man's Land was developed by the assistant editor Jordan B. Gorfinkel, and it was quickly approved by the main Batman editor Denny O'Neill. As a result, the Batman writers were instructed to take a dark turn to their stories and showcase an increasingly depressing scenario, with little hope for Gotham. The second half of Aftershock presents a morally defeated Batman, with stories called Grieving City and Dying City, showcasing the mass exodus of people abandoning Gotham. This idea that the Gothamites, people who are willing to deal with mass murderers, criminal psychopaths and rampant crime 24-7, were not willing to stay in a destroyed city speaks volumes, and it sets the stage for the incoming storyline. The idea behind Cataclysm was to shake things up in the Batman comics, but at the same time as this epic drama was unfolding in the printed pages, a real-life drama was taking place at DC Comics, when the main Batman writers and artists of the 90s were systematically removed and replaced. Artists Kelly Jones and Graham Nolan, who had worked for years on Batman and Detective Comics respectively, were replaced in Cataclysm, and by the end of Aftershock, writer Doug Mensch was also removed from the Batman title. Title. After six years of writing Batman, Mench's last story was printed in issue number 559, the final Batman chapter of Aftershock. The story is called Dead City, and it is a very depressing story that reads almost as a criticism of the direction that the comics were going, almost as if Doc Mench was making a subtle commentary about the future plans that DC Comics had for Batman. Without Mensch, the only Batman writers that remained were Chuck Dixon and Alan Grant, who, although created some of their best work during Aftershock, they were also on their way out. In the final three months of 1998, DC Comics started preparing the new creative teams for the start of No Man's Land, and in those three months, the Batman comics entered the Road to No Man's Land, a chapter that saw the Azrael series folding into the main Batman comics under the new title of Azrael, Agent of the Bat, and introduced a new villain called Nicholas Scratch. In this chapter, Chuck Dixon created stories for both Batman and Detective Comics, where Bruce Wayne would desperately try to convince Congress to help Gotham and to not abandon the city, though to no avail. The situation in Gotham also gets progressively worse, with Wayne Manor and the Batcave completely gone, a Bruce Wayne that goes missing, and Dr. Jeremiah Arkham left with no choice but to release the inmates of his asylum, before Gotham was declared a no-man's land. The Arkham Asylum storyline was written by Alan Grant in Shadow of the Bat, and this was also his final contribution to the Batman mythos before he was fired. After 10 years of writing Batman, Alan Grant was shown the door in the most unprofessional manner. Alan Grant's first story in Shadow of the Bat was the last Arkham back in 1992, so it's kind of fitting that his last Batman story in Shadow of the Bat was a tale about Arkham Asylum. 
1988, the Batman comics lost everything. Gotham City was utterly destroyed. The US government, the heroes and protectors of the city abandoned it, and the creative teams that built the Batman legacy all throughout the 90s were wiped out. All this deconstruction of the status quo was orchestrated by the Batman editorial team, who then assembled a new group of creators to develop one of the most ambitious projects ever seen in the Batman comics. No Man's Land began in January of 1999, under the creative guidance of Bob Gale, a famous Hollywood screenwriter who had written just one Batman story in 1998 and who is best known for writing the Back to the Future movies. DC Comics banked on Bob Gale's star power to give No Man's Land enough credibility and publicity. Gale's initial idea for No Man's Land was to take every single aspect of the Batman mythos to its darkest, most gritty realism, and the setting for that was perfect. The story begins three months after Gotham was declared a no-man's land and sealed off from the rest of the country. The city had become a war zone for control of territory and basic human needs. Oracle is one of the few heroes who stayed behind and she created a network of people who keep her informed about the wars for territories controlled by different factions. This Gotham feels like a complete stranger, as society has rearranged itself to the new needs of the city. Commissioner Gordon has abandoned his principles and his morality as he is willing to start wars against the street gangs and steal their territory to claim it for the GCPD. Gordon has also developed a hate for Batman, who has clearly abandoned Gotham, which complicates things further when a new Batgirl shows up. The identity of this mysterious new Batgirl is not revealed yet, and she eventually draws the attention of Batman, who finally returns to Gotham after three months. In order to make his presence known, to recover the respect and reputation that he once had, Batman takes down the ventriloquist and takes over his territory. These early chapters of No Man's Land were created with the idea of stripping down Batman to the most basic, dark and realistic concepts. There are none of the most fantastical aspects of the mythos, such as the Bat Computer, Batmobile or any of the fancy gadgets. Batman is forced to go back to being a detective and use tactical strategies to take down his enemies. There is also a darker approach to the visual storytelling that helps to emphasize the darker characterization of well-known characters, such as Commissioner Gordon with his new ruthless attitude, a completely new, darker and more realistic Batgirl, as well as Batman's refusal to get help from any of his allies, with only one exception. The Huntress is the only vigilante that remained in Gotham and kept fighting to maintain order over her territory. After Batman took down the ventriloquist, it was Huntress who helped Batman take down the Scarecrow, who was also reimagined as a darker, grittier and more serious version. This Scarecrow is a walking nightmare straight out of a horror movie, and instead of using fantastic chemicals to scare people, he uses his knowledge of psychology and philosophy to create fear among the people and make them afraid of each other. This chapter also brings back Dr. Leslie Thumpkins as a regular supporting character, and it also reveals that Batman has now a small headquarters hidden across Gotham. The first one to be revealed is located underneath the abandoned Arkham Asylum. Batman then turns his attention to the Penguin, who had become the overlord of Gotham's black market and underground dealings, providing entertainment, vice and depravity. Batman uses the Penguin's underground show to announce his return to all of Gotham, and also to recruit Penguin as an informant. Meanwhile, James Gordon makes an alliance with a mysterious character in order to gain more territory for the GCPD. However, the methods of this ally are extremely violent, making Gordon realize that he had just sold his soul to the devil. The next big villain to make a move is Black Mask, who also gets the dark and gritty treatment, as he burns his gangster suit, hat and mask and decides to show his true disfigured face to the world. Black Mask's group of followers also get the same treatment, as they are reinvented as these demented cult of freaks who destroy their own faces to be part of the cult. Black Mask and his forces are on a quest to destroy all the standing buildings in the city, and their next target is Oracle's Watchtower. Batman sends the new Batgirl to protect the place and, with a little help from the GCPD, they stop Black Mask, who is then taken to Blackgate, now run by Lockup and the KG Beast. In the confrontation with Black Mask, Oracle watched the new Batgirl in action and became sad and frustrated to learn that she had been replaced. Though she confronts Batman and they both know the identity of Batgirl, they never say it, holding on to the mystery for the readers a little longer. 
Now, at this point in the story, there's one glaring issue, and that's the visual inconsistency. While all of the stories so far kept the themes and concepts super dark and realistic, the different artists in each story creates a lack of visual consistency that is sometimes confusing. The dark and gritty art also resulted in poor visual storytelling, like in the final page of the Black Mask story, where the Taliban is torturing and killing someone in the final panel, and many people confuse this person with Black Mask, when in reality it was just one of his followers. At this point, four months had passed since No Man's Land began, and the storyline started to lose momentum. Many of the stories published after the Black Mask chapter are very forgettable, especially the Azrael chapters, where the only major thing that happens is that Azrael gets a new costume. A big part of this decline was the fact that the writer who started all of this, Bob Gale, literally disappeared after writing only one more story, where Batman saves a baby. Without Gale, the story was left in the hands of Devin Grayson and Greg Rocca, two very capable writers who had already written the majority of No Man's Land anyway. After Bob Gale's departure, No Man's Land also started to experience a shift in the art direction, with cleaner and sharper visuals to the stories. All of these changes came to a head in the two-chapter story called Claim Jumping, where Two-Face finally reveals himself as the mysterious character who has been dealing with Gordon behind the scenes. In this chapter, Two-Face manipulates Gordon into expanding the GCPD territory, while he sets up a trap for Batman with help from the Penguin, only to double-cross Cobblepot at the last minute to seize control of both Batman and Penguin's territories in one single strike. With the Dark Knight caught up in Penguin and Two-Face's trap, Batgirl is left all alone to defend Batman's territory against hundreds of Two-Face's men, a battle that she simply couldn't win. This is by far one of the greatest moments of No Man's Land. The war for territory, the military tactics, the conspiracies, the negotiations, the setups, the alliances and the betrayals are precisely what makes No Man's Land so thrilling and fascinating. Unfortunately, this would also be the last time that these concepts and themes are actually relevant to the story. After Batman returns to his territory and finds out what happened, No Man's Land goes in a completely different direction. After losing his territory, Batman realizes that he actually needs help and summons the rest of the Batman family to No Man's Land. At the same time, a mysterious girl is introduced as one of Oracle's informants and she is revealed to be the daughter of the assassin David Kane, who is also in Gotham and has been hired to kill Gordon. This very convenient family reunion is the introduction of Cassandra Kane, although her name is never actually revealed in No Man's Land. Nevertheless, she is introduced as an incredible fighter, trained to be an expert assassin since childhood and capable of taking down major threats, but who also has one big problem – she doesn't speak. The introduction of the Kane girl is what I consider to be the start of chapter 2 of No Man's Land. The reason for that is because the writing style and the visuals become drastically different. In chapter 1 of No Man's Land, the Batman mythos was looked through the lens of dark and gritty realism, with complex and grim stories about human nature and society, as well as realistic and sometimes dreadful art. Meanwhile, in chapter 2, the stories become much more brighter and optimistic, and the art becomes cleaner, sharper and more cartoony. And the return of the Batman family also allows for less serious stories, with friendly banter, jokes and comedy. It's at this point that the identity of the new Batgirl is revealed to be Helena Bertinelli, also known as the Huntress, when Batman confronts her about her failure to protect their territory from Two-Face's attack. Batman dismisses Huntress's efforts, and in a very dick move on his part, he tells her to stop wearing the mantle of Batgirl, and instead he allows the new girl to become the new Batgirl. Chapter 2 of No Man's Land also sees an increase in the line of comics, as Robin, Nightwing and also Catwoman join the storyline, which extends the already long saga into record-breaking limits. Back in 1999, this was certainly a real issue, as loyal readers who wanted to stay on top of the events of the storyline had to buy up to 10 comics per month just to keep up with No Man's Land. Needless to say, not many fans were happy about that. With the Batman family back together, Batman starts a master plan to take back Gotham. 
First, he sends Azrael to find and stop Nick Scratch, the madman directly responsible for No Man's Land. Azrael finally becomes an active protagonist in No Man's Land and takes down Scratch after a serious struggle with all of his followers. However, Scratch goes down rather easily, which is a complete letdown for a character that was apparently the evil force behind No Man's Land. Then Batman sends Nightwing to take back control of Blackgate. Nightwing has to go through a very challenging ordeal, fighting against the lockup, the KG Beast, and dozens of other criminals. Nightwing succeeds in his mission, but he barely comes out alive and manages to crawl his way back to Oracle, where the two of them spend some romantic time alone. Meanwhile, Batman and Robin go to Robinson Park, where Batman has hidden something important in the underground headquarters that he created there. However, once in Robinson Park, Batman and Robin fight Clayface, who had kidnapped Poison Ivy and forced the orphans of Gotham to work for him. The return of Poison Ivy and Clayface also mark the return of the more fantastic villains, which is another departure from the early chapters of No Man's Land, where the main villains were more dark and realistic. Then, Batman summons Catwoman and asks her to steal some valuable discs in New York City, the same discs that he was looking for underneath Robinson Park. Catwoman has to break into a highly secured area and confront powerful people to steal the discs, a mission that she barely manages to accomplish, but not without being seriously injured. Similarly, Robin goes on a mission down to the sewers, where he confronts and defeats the major threats of the Ratcatcher and Mr. Freeze, barely surviving the encounter. Basically, all the members of the Batman family were given incredibly hard missions, except for Batgirl, who just had to protect a gas station from a handful of street punks. Batman was probably trying to test the new Batgirl by giving her an easy task, while the more experienced members of the Batman family had to go through impossibly hard missions. In the end, Batgirl succeeds and Batman welcomes her into the family, which is still very convenient writing, considering all the challenges that Huntress had to go through as Batgirl. While Batman and his allies come together as a unit, the GCPD becomes fractured when the most ruthless members decide to leave Gordon's leadership and follow a new leader, the head of the tactical divisions called William Pettit. The new faction goes by the name of Strongmen, and the Huntress, who was feeling dejected and unwanted, decides to join them. With much of the territory now in control of the GCPD and the Strongmen, Gordon tries to pull out of his deal with Two-Face, but of course, Dent doesn't like that and instead he kidnaps René Montoya. Similar to what happened in part 1, halfway through part 2 of No Man's Land, DC started publishing many irrelevant stories, filler chapters that are very lighthearted and don't advance the main storyline. For every excellent Batman Chronicles number 18, there's a mediocre Azrael number 58. The most significant moment of Chapter 2 of No Man's Land is, without a doubt, the official introduction of Harley Quinn into the main Batman comics. Harley's introduction is a complete departure from the dark and gritty stories from the start of No Man's Land, and she was introduced at this point because the Joker started to become one of the most prominent villains of the story, appearing more frequently and joined by Harley. Chapter 2 was all about the coming together of the Batman family and the fracture of the GCPD, which is why the appearance of Bane in the story marks the beginning of a new chapter. The third and final chapter of No Man's Land for me starts with the appearance of Bane. He was an outsider who wasn't in Gotham when No Man's Land started, and who was hired by a mysterious outside player to infiltrate into No Man's Land and blow up the Hall of Records that contained the printed records of real estate, buildings and business ownerships across Gotham. Once again, Bane is nothing more than hired muscle, and after his previous appearances, it becomes clear that the once criminal mastermind who broke the bat had become nothing but a simple fuck for hire. Bane's actions are clearly part of a master plan by someone who wants to capitalize on the disaster that has happened to Gotham, and it takes the storyline in a completely different direction. While chapters 1 and 2 consisted about survival and forging alliances to fight for control of the city, chapter 3 becomes a story about corporate plans to take over Gotham. Part of Bane's plan was to weaken the leaders of the territories, and he started with Two-Face. After losing his territory, Two-Face organizes a trial against James Gordon, with René Montoya acting as a witness. Two-Face forces them to be part of this charade, although he intends to kill Gordon anyway. That is, until Montoya and Gordon convince him that Harvey Dent should represent Gordon, and Two-Face starts a trial against himself. It's an excellent story that explores Two-Face's duality and his feelings for René Montoya. 
The plotline of Two-Face, Gordon and Montoya was the last loose thread that remained from Chapter 1, and after it was resolved, the home stretch of No Man's Land began, when Batman and Gordon finally get to talk in a long overdue discussion, where Gordon confronts Batman about abandoning the city, and the trust issues that had been building up all throughout the 90s between the two of them. This is where it's finally explained why Batman abandoned Gotham for the first three months of No Man's Land, as Bruce Wayne was morally defeated, and he had to find the strength to return and reinvent himself to keep fighting. Though this is a great way of showing Batman's humanity and his weakness after facing terrible challenges all throughout the last decade, it's still weird that he was the only one that needed to find motivation and strength to keep going, when literally the GCPD, Alfred, Huntress, Oracle and even Dr. Leslie Thumpkins had enough strength to keep going. It makes Batman look really bad. That frustration that many of us felt with that storytelling decision was very well expressed by Gordon when he punched Batman in the face. But eventually, in their long overdue discussion, Batman is willing to admit his mistakes, and in a very honest attempt to regain Gordon's trust, Batman removes his cowl and allows Gordon to see his real identity. However, Gordon refuses to look at him, and after that the two of them decide to put the past behind them and work together once again to protect the city against the ominous threat of the mysterious mastermind behind everything, who is finally revealed to be none other than Lex Luthor. Luthor has hired Bane to destroy the public records so that he could seize the majority of Gotham's assets, real estate and businesses, and become the major owner of the city in order to rebuild the place from the ground up. However, thanks to Catwoman stealing the digital records contained in highly secure disks, Batman is able to uncover the fraud, and with a little help from Lucius Fox, they foil Luthor's plan. Nevertheless, the involvement of Luthor and his eagerness to rebuild Gotham got the attention of the US government, and alongside a very convenient public mission to rescue Team Drake from the Forbidden Zone of No Man's Land, the government finally decides to bring Gotham back into the country and rebuild the city using federal fundings as well as private money from LexCorp and Wayne Enterprises. The people of Gotham are given one month to rebuild the city, and everyone starts working day and night to make it happen, all of them except for the renegade cop William Pettit and his territory controlled by the strongmen. Pettit had gone completely off the rails, thinking that this was still a war zone and preventing anyone from entering or leaving his territory. At the same time, Batman and his allies become really concerned about the Joker, who had gone missing in the midst of all these developments. Never mind that Batman had a whole year of opportunities to stop the literally most dangerous man in Gotham. It's only on the brink of the end of No Man's Land that Batman finally gets concerned about his major arch nemesis. This convenient bit of storytelling allows the Joker to come up with one of his most evil plans ever. Before No Man's Land comes to an end, Joker wants to steal hope from everyone, and he intends to do it by kidnapping and killing the newborn babies in Gotham. Joker decides to attack the most obvious place, the weakened territory of the strongmen, protected by Pettit and Huntress. What follows is a massacre, where Joker disguises Pettit's men as himself and causes the lunatic renegade cop to start shooting at his own people. It's only after Pettit has killed almost a dozen of his own men and he intentionally shoots one of them that Huntress finally deals with him, killing Pettit right on the spot. Or at least, that's what it looks like. To be perfectly honest, the art doesn't make it clear who actually kills Pettit at first glance. Everything happens so fast and off-camera that you need to do a double-take to realize that it was actually Joker. With Pettit dead, Joker and his men move in and attack the Huntress, who fights valiantly to protect her people until she is eventually overcome by the Joker, who sadistically shoots her multiple times before getting ready to kill her. All of this happens in Batman number 574, the final Batman comic of 1999 and without question, the most violent Batman comic ever printed up until that moment. Batman and Nightwing show up in time to save Huntress, who finally gets to hear some words of approval from Batman. All that was necessary was to be on the brink of death at the hands of a maniac to finally get some recognition. The story of Huntress is very tragic, because she stayed in Gotham to fight from day one. She brought back the mantle of Batgirl and became one of the most interesting characters of No Man's Land, who sacrificed more than anyone else in the city. And all that she got in return was pain. 
Naturally, the Joker escaped in that encounter in order to create the big finale for No Man's Land. Having kidnapped dozens of babies already, the Joker sends the entire Batman family and the GCPD on a wild goose chase trying to find the babies before he kills them. Unfortunately, it was Sarah Essen, James Gordon's wife, who accidentally finds the Joker hidden at the GCPD headquarters. How exactly did Joker manage to sneak all those noisy babies inside the police headquarters without anyone noticing is never explained. But logic doesn't always apply here, and Sarah becomes the unfortunate last victim of No Man's Land when the Joker decides to kill her before giving himself up. Though the Joker was the final villain of the saga, Batman did nothing to stop him. In fact, they barely crossed paths in No Man's Land. Azrael, Huntress and Sarah did confront the Joker and actually tried to stop him, with unfortunate results. Azrael was severely burned by one of Joker's bombs at the end of the storyline, while Huntress was mistreated and brutalized, and Sarah paid the ultimate price. To me, they are the true heroes of No Man's Land, even though it is Batman who gets to stand tall and proud in the final issue, welcoming a new year, a new millennium, as the finest protector of Gotham after stopping Lex Luthor's evil corporate plans. I think that it really says a lot about the storyline that Batman's most decisive victory was over the evil white-collar scheme of Superman's arch-nemesis, rather than stopping and defeating his most iconic enemy. The death of Sarah Essen is a completely incidental event, the result of an unfortunate circumstance where she stumbled upon Joker's plan by accident, creating even more pain for the life of James Gordon. Many people argue that this should have been the moment when Gordon killed the Joker, but honestly, Joker wasn't really planning to kill Sarah in the first place. And besides, having Gordon killing Joker would go against the point that No Man's Land was trying to make. Because, you see, James Gordon represents Gotham City. Before Gotham was declared a No Man's Land, Gordon tried to get out and find a job somewhere else, which represents Gotham quite literally reaching out for help. But Gordon quickly realized that nobody wanted to hire him because he was seen as a joke, the failed cop who depended on a boogeyman to do his job in the same way that Gotham was perceived as a failed city that depended on Batman to keep things in order. It was this reality check that convinced Gordon to stay in Gotham and fight for the city. But as No Man's Land started and society crumbled apart, Gotham became a place without morals, without principles and without values. The exact same thing that happened to Gordon. In order to survive, Gordon adopted a new attitude and made unethical decisions in order to protect his people. This Gordon would have definitely killed Joker. But as the story progressed and society started taking shape once again, Gotham City began to heal, and so did Gordon, who recovered his principles, his morals and ethics, and almost paid dearly for his past mistakes. So by the time Joker kills Sarah, Gotham has been almost completely restored, and this is the final test for a character that has gone through hell and almost lost his soul in the process. Gotham City went on a journey of tragedy and redemption, and by the end of No Man's Land, Commissioner James by the book Gordon wasn't going to sacrifice his principles and his morale just to get revenge on the Joker, and his refusal to kill him is the biggest symbol that Gotham City has healed and is back to normal. It might be a cop-out from doing what actually needs to be done and keep DC's biggest cash cows alive, but damn, this is an amazingly told cop-out. The final issue of No Man's Land was published in December of 1999, and it became the official send-off to the 90s, the decade when Batman achieved new levels of success, and this final chapter of the decade, of the millennium, is also a bittersweet ending to the most epic saga ever told in the Batman comics. While some characters celebrate the life of Sarah, others mourn their tragic loss. But every time she is brought up, the image of Commissioner Gordon sharing happy moments with Sarah starts resonating in the collective minds of the readers who witness their growth and their love cultivated for over a decade, and it's really hard not to feel sad about it. And although the journey of characters like Gordon and Huntress are super interesting, the journey of Batman is what people really love about No Man's Land. The idea of a broken vigilante that starts out as a dark loner and then decides to lighten up and call his friends and family for help is the most Batman thing ever. 
What happens to Batman in No Man's Land is literally what happens to him every time in history. He always starts out as a dark and gritty loner, he fails in the process and becomes brighter when he assembles a team of trusted allies to get things done. So basically what No Man's Land does is it condenses the entire history of Batman into one major storyline, and that's why people love it so much. Although it doesn't make sense in continuity, as the character starts repeating himself over and over again. By the end of No Man's Land we get to celebrate Gotham's victory, but we never actually get to see the reconstruction of Wayne Manor, the Batcave or Crime Alley. In the end, we don't even know what happened to any of the major places that were destroyed at the very beginning. In that sense, the story doesn't have a real sense of closure, because pretty much everything went back to how things were before, and for how much things were destroyed at the beginning, it just doesn't feel like it was worth it. No Man's Land is a phenomenal Batman story, the crowning achievement of the Batman comics in the 90s that introduced a new Batgirl and finally got Harley Quinn into the main Batman comics. The story certainly proved the point that the Batman comics had grown so big in the 90s that a project of this magnitude was only possible in these comics. With all that said, No Man's Land is far from perfect. Although it has a great start, the visual inconsistency of the art is very noticeable, and the storytelling becomes quite forced and convenient at certain moments, while the continuity starts to get a bit confusing by the end of the saga. Considering how long this story is, it could definitely use a redux version that takes away all the filler stuff, all the stories that I didn't mention here, because they are just not relevant to the main plotline. It's almost impossible to find someone whose first Batman story was No Man's Land. After all, it is not a great starting point compared to other stories such as Year One, Hush or even Nightfall. While No Man's Land is one of the most popular and well-recognized Batman stories ever, it's mostly for how long it is. And yes, the Dark Knight Rises movie, the Arkham City video game and the later seasons of the Gotham TV show were all inspired by No Man's Land, undeniably one of the most influential Batman stories, but also one of the most problematic. With over 100 comic book issues and more than 2,000 pages, No Man's Land is quite possibly the longest comic book story ever. It's a great display of editorial and artistic coordination, which resulted in the most excessive crossover that alienated loyal Batman readers at the time of its publication, with unreasonable amounts of monthly comic books just to keep up with a story that felt too different from everything that had come before, and which ultimately changed almost nothing. It's no wonder that not many people choose this as their first Batman story, because although it has been neatly collected in omnibuses and trade paperbacks, it still remains the most challenging Batman story to read from beginning to end. The sheer amount of content in this storyline can be overwhelming for new readers, and although it provides a unique experience unlike anything seen before or seen in the Batman comics, the sacrifices required to make this story possible took a heavy toll on the creative side at DC Comics and the Batman mythos as a whole. A story that pulled all the stops to succeed and, in the process, changed the Batman history for better or for worse. That is No Man's Land, the Batman story that went too far. Friends, thank you for taking your time to watch this video. I really enjoyed going back to No Man's Land a second time almost 10 years later and finding things that I missed the first time, although it was definitely a challenge because there are entire comic runs that are shorter than No Man's Land, and I'm not sure I'm going to ever read the whole thing again for a third time. That said, I would love to hear your thoughts about the storyline, and I also want to thank my Patreons and channel members who keep the lights on on this channel. If you like what I do here, consider taking a look at my Patreon and be part of these awesome folks who I am really, really grateful for. As always, thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.